Okay, uh, Minor Prophets. There are 67 chapters in one scroll, and um, all of the prophets of the Old Testament, none of those writings have been lost. You say, well, of course not. We have them in the Bible. Okay, so that's not a late ad. That's not a mistake. Um, can you tell me one of the, the most solid evidences that our text was around in the days of Christ? No? Yes? I think the Zechariah is, uh, is no. 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 Anyway, anybody else? Yes? Christ quoted it. Yes, that's true. So they were around the days of Christ, but I'm saying from our perspective, we know that these were in existence at the time of Christ. And the reason we know that is because every single book of the Old Testament, every single prophet of the Old Testament, is quoted in some portion in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls were destroyed, some, or were not destroyed, were, were hidden there somewhere around the destruction of Jerusalem. So that means that we have the actual Old Testament writings from the days of Jesus Christ. And, and I, I know, we already believe that. We have our scriptures and we hold to those strongly. But man, is that great evidence. <clears throat> so, all right, so none of those are lost. That's my point. Um, the minor prophets are minor because of their size, not because of their importance. Uh, obviously, they're very important. So never think of them as lesser prophets. They're minor prophets because of the shortness of the books. Um, by the way, this should be on Schoology, or is it? Oh, is it not? I'm sorry. Um, can I do that for you real quickly? Uh, let, me, let me get that over on Schoology real quickly. So all of you, if you have access to it, you can see it. Um, <coughs> class handouts. All right, I'm just going to quickly link to this. I'm pretty sure I have this ready to go. All right. Um, this is. It is not there. It is here. And it's under a PDF. Alright, try that. So you can follow along. I, I saw somebody writing here, and I realized that, that you were following along with this. Um, I want you to have this. Um, okay, so uh, Obadiah, or I'm sorry, uh, it's minor size, not in importance. All right, so uh, they also cover about four centuries, Obadiah being one of the first prophets. Um, there's not a lot of mention, we believe, made of this Obadiah. Is there a chance that it's the Obadiah of Ahab? I guess so, but most people don't believe that. Obadiah to Malachi. Malachi is certainly the latest prophet, the latest writer of the, of the Old Testament. Um, not anybody argues that, that I know of. <clears throat> if there's anyone that would argue in any way with this, it, it's those who believe the apocryphal writings are also to be a part of Scripture, and so Malachi is not the latest. The Apocryphal writings were clearly written during the time of the Maccabeans and, and others even, you know, from 300 B.C. to the time of Christ. And so Malachi, we believe, is the latest writer, not the Apocryphal writings, which uh, came out of the uh, Maccabean time period primarily. Okay, so... Let's look at Obadiah, and we'll work our way through these, 845. Now, these dates, don't take them as the gospel truth, but we're, we're close. Obviously, Obadiah lived for more than one year, but uh, it's believed to come somewhere around this time period. This is the smallest of all the writings of the, minor, of the prophets, and uh, the main theme of the book is about the fall of Edom, Edom, the Edomite Empire, which is uh, started by really all the way back to Esau, goes, goes that far back. But Edom was a, a part of a, a very prosperous, um, uh, what do you 
you call it, a trade system. And uh, Petra was the capital of Edom. Did you go to Petra? Okay, I've not been there. Um, red Rock, Edom means red. Uh, Adam, it's very similar to the name Adam. Um, red soil, and so these reddish mountains are a part of Edom. And Petra is the capital, of course, Petra. Uh, beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, I've seen lots of pictures of it and not been there. But it would fall because of their wickedness and because they rejected, they were against the children of Israel. Of course, the Edomites are Esau's descendants versus Jacob's descendants. And so there was always that uh, back and forth bitterness between these two families. Um, they rejoiced over the fall. They would rejoice over the fall of Jerusalem. So when Jerusalem fell, and it was after this, it was 300 years later, but Obadiah says the Edomites are going to, to celebrate when Jerusalem falls, and because of that, they're going to be destroyed. And that would be the final straw. Um, they were uh, ruled by Idumean kings who assisted Rome. There's a famous Idumean who ruled Israel. Anybody remember who that was? From Edom. It's a guy you'll all recognize. He was assisted by Rome. Pilate. Nope. He was, he was directly a Roman. This guy was an Idumean who had Roman connections. Not he wasn't Roman. His name is Herod the Great. Okay, so he's from Edom. He married a Jew to give him connection to the Jewish state and, uh, of course, rule from that. Obadiah. Joel. Joel, 835, about that time. The theme here is the day of the Lord. That's the important thing to know with Joel. The day of the Lord. What does he talk about? The final days and what's going to happen in those final days. Now, the day of the Lord is a very vague term because it can mean a day of doom and destruction. The day of the Lord can mean a day of judgment. It can mean a number of other things even. And so the, the book of Joel, and again remember that was all of Old Testament prophecy, is that they, that they didn't always see the split in time from the time of Christ coming, the Messiah coming the first time, to the coming of Christ the second time. So the book of Joel is very famous for this, that Joel saw what was going to happen when Christ came the first time, but he didn't know that there would be a long distance, of t a long amount of time between the first coming and the second coming. And so he talks about what would happen when Christ came. Your young daughter shall see visions and dream dreams, and your young men shall prophesy, and so on. And, and Peter said in Acts chapter 2 that that was fulfilled in his day. In the day of Pentecost, that verse was fulfilled, Joel 2.23. Well, Joel also talks about the second coming of the Lord, but he has no idea that there's a big length of time in between those two. So, <clears throat> think of it this way, and I've, I've used this illustration, I think it's a good way to understand how they didn't see the, the amount of time between the first and the second coming. If you've ever been in the mountains... <clears throat> You see a mountain, a huge mountain, up close and in front of you. And then way off in the distance, you see a, a smaller peak. And someone says, yeah, that bigger peak, that's actually the biggest mountain out here. And you're saying, no, 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 there's no way, because it looks small by comparison because you have a large mountain right in front of you. And then when you come around the mountain or you come up on top of the first mountain and then the big mountain towers up above you in front of you and you realize all the space still between you and that larger mountain. And that's very similar to how it was with these, these prophets is that they didn't see that there was a difference in time between the first coming and the second coming. Okay, so that's important to remember with Joel, the day of the Lord. Next, Jonah. His name means dove. Um, I don't know. You know. What do you think of a dove? I don't know. Um, friendly birds, kind of. <laughs> I was up in the dorm the last week and um, cleaning the gutters. <clears throat> and I come around the, you know, around the corner there to this next section of gutter, and there sits a dove right in front of me. And he had a nest in the gutter. She had a nest in the gutter. And so 
I sit there, I mean, I'm two feet from this dove sitting there, and I just kind of sat there looking at it, and she's looking at me. Finally, I went, Psh! and she flew away, and there's two nice little white eggs, two big white eggs uh, in the nest. So anyway, dove, so whatever that's supposed to be, Jonah. He uh, was from Galilee, from the tribe of Zebulun, <clears throat> and uh, he was to take the message of destruction to the capital of Assyria, which is Nineveh. And uh, that was, of course, not what he wanted to do, so he went the other direction, um, fled to Tarshish, out across the Mediterranean. Uh, from where he was, Assyria was to the east. Tarshish was to the west. And so he, of course, being commanded to go east, went west and didn't want to go. So uh, did Jonah get swallowed by a whale? trivia. Yes? Um, no, the whole Bible just says it was a large fish. Okay, in the book of Jonah it says it was a great fish. But somewhere else it says it was a whale. Jesus said it was a whale. So if you don't believe Jesus, go ahead and call it a great fish. Okay, what? I was going to say that, you know, a great fish could also be the same thing as a whale back then. You know? Of course. Yeah. But it was a whale. Jesus said it was a if you want to look that up and give me the verse for it, that's fine, but I don't remember what it was. Um, just be careful that you don't state the opposite, you know, that Jonah happened to swallow a big fish. <coughs> so, it might be difficult. <laughs> All right, uh, book of Jonah. So, always remember this. There's two books where they talk about Nineveh. Jonah is only the first of the two. In the book of Jonah, be careful... The, the, Ninevite, the city of Nineveh was not destroyed because of Jonah's warnings. In fact, they were saved. There's another book that describes the destruction of Nineveh. Anybody know what it is? It's right down here on the bottom. Uh, why, am I, why is my next page not pulling up? Gotcha. I'm going to switch to the next one. Um, who is it? Nahum. Nahum. I might not see this. Oh, there we go. All right, uh, Nahum. Yes, the destruction of Nineveh. All right, so let's go back there. Um, any questions or thoughts on Jonah? Someone said that Jonah snored up a storm. <laughs> Hosea. I wasn't trying to do that. <laughs> That's that funny. We got a lot more jokes for you. <laughs> Hosea. His name means salvation. Okay, there's a lot of names in the in the Bible that are very similar to Hosea. Right? Hoshea, Joshua. Um, same idea. The H and the J are very interchangeable. It means salvation. It's very similar to the name Jesus in reality. So Hosea. Um, he is the Jeremiah of the northern kingdom. What's Jeremiah known as? The weeping prophet. And uh, this is Hosea in the northern kingdom. So Jeremiah saw the destruction of Jerusalem. Hosea sees the destruction of Samaria and the northern kingdom. And he did the oddest thing. God told him to, well, there's a couple other things that are really odd, but this is one. God told him to marry a harlot. And she was a harlot, and he married her. Now, there's a lot of debate over whether he actually, you know, maybe she had been a harlot in the past, whatever. There's, I mean, the Bible, to me, is just really clear that this woman was a harlot, and he married her, and God told him to. And again, why would he do that? Why would God tell him to do that? To demonstrate the nature of Israel and how they were in their harlotry against God, and uh, therefore this is an object lesson, <laughs> a real life object lesson. Woo! So that was in Hosea. Wow. He's quoted more percentage wise than any other prophet. Now, there's another prophet that's quoted more actually, but percentage wise, Hosea is quoted the most. Okay. Any, any thoughts on that? 
Yes. What, do, what exactly does it mean percentage-wise? Okay, so Hosea is a short book. I would say compared to how much is actually written. Is that what right. You mean? Okay. Isaiah is quoted more than any other Old Testament book, uh, more than any Old Testament prophet. So Isaiah is quoted the most, but Isaiah is 66 chapters. So the percentage of the length of Hosea is quoted. So yes. Okay. okay, Amos. Amos was famous. That was for Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even funny, but she might have been. All right, Amos was from the city, the village of Tekoa. Tekoa, if you stand at um, Herodium, which is south of Bethlehem, you can see Herodium. If you stand at Herodium, you look off to the south, just a little ways further than that, you can easily see Tekoa, a little village. And so this is where Amos is from. So think about that. Where is Bethlehem? In Judah. That's in Judah. So he's down south of Bethlehem. He's in the land of Judah. And where does he go? He goes to the northern kingdom of Israel. So Hosea, I'm sorry, Amos is literally going to a foreign nation who was at odds with Judah, and he warns them that God's going to destroy them for their sin. So that's pretty neat. His name means burden, and he carried a heavy burden, uh, the message of destruction for the northern kingdom. <clears throat> So often in his book it says, for three transgressions or for four. In other words, there, there's a time coming where you are going to run out on the patience of God. God won't, won't be patient with you if you continue in sin. He denounces eight nations methodically, listing off their sins. And Israel is one of them. Amos. Micah. Micah is next. What do you know Micah for? Most, Micah 5, verse 2, right? Probably. Um, Micah 5, 2, of course, talks about the birth and the reign of Christ. Um, so this book is a very key book. Um, when was Micah used specifically? I already told you Micah 5, 2, so take that uh, passage. Think about where, when was the book of Micah used specifically for something? Yes. When the wise women were before Herod, and uh, they were the um, Herod's um, uh, priests, I think. I don't know. The, the, so um, Herod's in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, they, they, they met with Herod, and Herod said to the wise, to the wise men, and to the scribes, "Where is there any evidence of where Jesus, this King, is going to be born?" And they said, "It's in Bethlehem, Judah." Now, when we were in Israel. We were up by Nazareth, and our guide said, well, there's potentially a very good possibility that the Bethlehem of J Judah is not actually the Bethlehem uh, where Jesus was born. Because right over there, on the other hill over there, that's Bethlehem. Right there next to Nazareth. So he said there's no evidence of anywhere else people going to pay taxes in their hometown. Like Luke chapter 2 says. So we said, well, I guess in that case, we'll just believe the Bible, you know? <laughs> As the Bible says in Micah 5, too, Now Bethlehem Ephrata, that Bethlehem Ephrata is mentioned very specifically as the place where Jesus would be born. Not Bethlehem uh, Nazareth or Bethlehem Galilee or anything like that. It's Bethlehem Ephrata. And where was that? Uh, we know very clearly from the book of Genesis that, that uh, that's down in the area of Judah. <clears throat> Alright, so, the book of Micah also talks about the fall of Samaria, the invasion of Judah by the Assyrians, fall of the fallen destruction of Judah, and the temple. So, very important, specific prophecies about 150 years before they would take place, as far as the destruction of Jerusalem. Of course, Jesus coming on the scene, that would be for 700 more years. Um, the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, the name of the town. Okay, Nahum. Yes, question? Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you mean by playing on words the first? I don't remember, but I think it has something to do with that he uses, he uses puns in his... Oh, in the book. In, in the Hebrew cool. that, that he used. And I don't remember exactly what that was. Okay. <laughs> I had it marked down a long time ago, and I've forgotten. 
But that's probably the only thing I've ever forgotten. <laughs> don't ask my wife. <laughs> Book of Micah. Nahum. What's interesting about Nahum? Jennifer, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you remember Nahum? Yes, a place where we visited. It means home of Nahum. I never thought of this until the guy pointed it out. You don't know. Kefir or what? I was going to say Capernaum. 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 Never put that together. Capernaum means home of Nahum. <laughs> so I don't know if this is this Nahum, but uh, still. His name is Comfort, and he prophesied the destruction of the Ninevite uh, city, city of Nineveh. And so it describes the, the size of the city, so there. Okay, now remember this. When we say that Nineveh would be destroyed, what that means simply is that the capital of the Assyrian Empire would be destroyed. And so there were Assyrians in, in some type of form even after this time, but the capital of Nineveh would be destroyed. And really neat, it talks in, in the book of Nahum, it talks about how the city of Nineveh, the hill that it's built on, would be a grazing place. And if you look at old pictures in the 1860s and 70s, some of the early archaeologists who dug around Jerusalem and so on, also dug at Nineveh. And one of the first things they found when they, when they got there is the place was covered in goats, just like the Bible says it would be. And people that were living around, they would think this is Nineveh. This is where the, the old ancient city, I mean, it'd be like Washington, D.C., being covered with grazing goats. <laughs> I mean, just imagine that. And so it's pretty amazing. The prophecies are exactly the way it says. So you, you're from around there. <laughs> They already got a bunch of goats out there anyway. But they're not the greatest of all time either. <clears throat> all right, Nahum. Zephaniah, related to King Hezekiah, great-great-grandson. Uh, so he's a prophet, and uh, he prophesies during the reign of Josiah. So we're coming down close to the end. Zephaniah, obviously, this is that third revival, right? If you got that on your quiz, I hope. Um, but the third revival took place under Josiah, and Zephaniah prophesied during that time. Now, Habakkuk, or do you say Habakkuk? Habakkuk. I, I've often said it that way since I was a little kid. Um, he starts out in his book, and your book talks about this, your uh, textbook. Hezekiah, I'm sorry, Habakkuk is a wonderful, wonderful book. And very poetic. Remember that it's one of the most poetic of all the Old Testament writings. And uh, Habakkuk begins in gloom and ends in glory. So read the few chapters of Habakkuk and it's all misery and downcast at the beginning. And he comes out of that when he realizes that Christ is coming and I'm going to restore Israel and restore all things. And look at the time of Habakkuk. It's 609, which is right before the first deportation of the city of Jerusalem in 605. So right at this time, Habakkuk is, you know, he's a contemporary to Jeremiah the prophet. Because Jeremiah is going to be on the scene full force by 586. So he's a contemporary with some of those later, other later prophets. Habakkuk. Doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. Um, there's questions about, it says at number four, the Levitical chorister. There's, there's questions that he may have had some influence in the choir of the temple, uh, the sons of Asaph. So it's interesting that way. All right, any questions on that? So he's the last of the minor prophets uh, living at the time before the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So... Now we're going to move to the other three. These, of course, are post-exile, 520, 520, and 435. Post-exile means after, of course, the exile to Babylon. So these last three, Haggai, it's the first of the post-exiles. And, of course, the book of Haggai starts out, 
How, how live we in our houses and the house of God lies in ruin, ruins? You know, how can we have, we built up our places and the house of God has not been finished. We need to get back to work on it. So they get back to work and finish the house of God. It's the second smallest of all the books of the writings in the Old Testament. Zechariah, I don't really have much on Zechariah. There's 14 chapters, I believe, and... Isn't it? I think it's 14, and the last chapter is absolutely amazing. Zechariah 14 talks in detail about the second coming of Christ. Second coming, not the rapture as we believe, but the actual second coming when Christ comes back to the earth for the first time since he, when he left from the Mount of Olives. And it says exactly where he's coming back to in Zechariah 14. He's coming back to the exact same spot that he left from. So they better get that church out of the way that's on top of the Mount of Olives. <laughs> you know, has a, there's a rock in that, inside the church and it has a footprint in it. And he pushed off from there to go up to heaven. <laughs> so say, who is she? Anybody? The mother of Constantine. <laughs> she identified Helena. Hooray for Helena. She found everything, including the cross, 350 years later. <laughs> All right, uh, but anyway, Zechariah. Uh, exact, specific prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Um, the Bible says that when, when the Messiah comes and he steps foot on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split open with a great earthquake. And, I mean, if you know it, the Mount of Olives is covered with graves, and those graves are going to be broken open. And a lot of Jews believe that there will be a bridge that will go directly from the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley and into the, uh, the Temple Mount. So if that's the case, Messiah will land and walk straight over onto the Temple Mount. That's the thing. It's pretty awesome. All right, Malachi, last. The last of the Old Testament writers is in 435. And of course, um, he's trying to stir up revival. This has been 100 and so, about 100 years after they've returned back to the land. And the people are living in, you know, they've gotten comfortable. Anyway, it's a lot of very discouraged and depressed people. They're under Greek rule at this time. Seleucid kings. No, by this, at this time, they're under the Ptolemies of Egypt. But the Greek rule, and, um, and they've gotten very backslidden. And does Malachi ever stir things up? Of course, we know Malachi because of what is the main thing we use Malachi for? Yes? Um, giving. Giving. Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So, Malachi is a great book. All right, next, let's move on to these other four major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. I almost said Lamentation. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. All right, four books. Isaiah, largest of all <coughs> books in the Old Testament. <clears throat> there are 66 chapters. Now, this book is very similar to the layout of the Bible. So, there are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. There are 66 books in the Bible. There are the historical section of Isaiah, 1 through 39, is historical. Chapter 38 and 39 end with the destruction of Jerusalem and exact, you know, a lot of details about that. Remember I told you the story of those bula they found with people's names on them. Okay, that's in Isaiah chapter 30, 38 and 39. So anyway, the historical section of, of Isaiah is the first 39 chapters. The 27 chapters after that are prophetic. Of course, that matches the Old Testament and the New Testament, 39 and 27. And there's a number of other things. Isaiah is quoted more than any Old Testament book. Quoted and quoted and quoted and quoted. Um, can you think of uh, any quotes from the New Testament of Isaiah? Or even references to Isaiah? Yes. 
Who is reading Isaiah? Yes. The eunuch? Yes. Ethiopian eunuch. So what, is what, was he re what was he reading? Uh, was it... <laughs> I don't think it was 53. Was it? Yes, it was. Oh, it was he was reading Isaiah 53, the most famous passage, I think, in the whole Old Testament, probably. Clearly talking about Christ. And, and you think Philip shows up. Here's this guy reading Isaiah 53 that we now know is so obviously about Jesus. And the story of the, of the uh, crucifixion and all that, surely the Ethiopian eunuch, if he wasn't in Jerusalem when it happened, he would have known about it. Because he was there for a reason. He'd come to visit the temple. Which, By the way, that, that whole just because the Ethiopian eunuch was even there in Jerusalem says something about the news of, you know, the, the belief in Jesus, the belief in God, the belief in the temple, that that had spread to Africa. And there was a, there's a lot of evidence now that uh, there were Ethiopian Jews and there were Egyptian Jews. There was that, that belief system had spread into Africa. Anyway, so he had come up to visit at the temple, which of course wasn't necessary anymore. And here's Philip telling him, pointing him very clearly through Isaiah 53, saying this is what just happened in Jerusalem just a few months ago. And this is the same Jesus that just got crucified. This is, this is the prophecy being fulfilled. So, pretty awesome. Anybody else? Any other quotes? How about when Jesus walked into, as he started his earthly ministry, he went into the synagogue at Nazareth, I believe. Yes, I believe at Nazareth. He walks into the It was either Nazareth or Capernaum. He walks into that synagogue and he quotes. They ask him, anybody like to read? And he stands up and he quotes Isaiah chapter, I can't even think now where it is, 450 something, I believe. And he said, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. <laughs> and, ooh, boy, that stirred up a whole bee's nest, you know. Um, but anyway, Jesus quoted the book of Isaiah and many other times as the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, saith. Um, so, a lot of prophecies. So, this is the Messianic book. It talks about Jesus, the Messiah. So, the Messiah's incarnation in Isaiah 7, 14. His youth in chapter 11, his relationship with the Father in chapter 42. His miracles foretold in chapter 35. There it is. His message in chapter 61. That was the thing I'm thinking of. Um, the acceptable year of the Lord, and it goes on, six, chapter 61. His suffering in chapter 50, chapter 52, and of course chapter 53. His resurrection, ascension, and exaltation, and then his millennial reign. And again, Isaiah is one of those prophets who, who saw the, re the coming of Christ, and he saw things about the very last days that have yet not taken place, and he saw all of that as one. So that's why these people so strongly believe when the Messiah comes, he's going to set up a kingdom and we're going to go straight into the millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And it didn't happen that way, large gap. So Isaiah was under the same impression. Any questions on Isaiah? <clears throat> okay. Um, when was Isaiah called of God? In, where at in the book of Isaiah? Chapter 6. Chapter 6. Very good. Where was he? In chapter 6. We don't say chapter 6. <laughs> Where was he? You remember? Yes? In the temple. He was in the temple. Right? And he was called of God. And he was the man who stood in the gap. Okay. Jeremiah. Let's move on. Chapter... I'm sorry. Not chapter. Um, how many? Yeah. Uh, there's about 40... So chapters, I forget. <clears throat> Jeremiah was the son of a priest. Uh, so note, make sure you remember some of these things about Jeremiah. He was commanded to remain single all his life, and he did. <clears throat> he, uh, he, of course, was there at the destruction of Jerusalem. And there was something I was going to say about that. but Anyway, uh, he was chosen before he was even born. 
Jeremiah 1, 7 says, when thou wast in the womb. So before he was born, he was called of God. Um, and he was very harsh against Judah's sins. Of course, he's there to the very end, and so he's calling out their sin, and they didn't like it. Um, boy, he called out the worship of the Queen of Heaven. Chapter 44 is aw awfully telling on the type of worship that was going on in Jerusalem, in the temple. The Bible gave, God gave him insight. He opened the door, and he saw all these people Worshipping the Queen of Heaven. Well, that's none other than, yeah, anyway, a lot of conspiracy story, but probably none other than the mother of Nimrod, worshipping her as a goddess, and on and on. So, uh, very similar, what's odd as can be, is that the Catholics call Mary the Queen of Heaven. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly what Jeremiah warns against, and saw people worshipping. He also warns about sacrifice of their own children, the murder of their own prophets, and so he's preaching down their throats. He warned about the coming captivity, and then the actual event of the captivity to Babylon. He was persecuted and imprisoned, but later released, and I don't know, but there's a pit that we saw a few months ago uh, in the courtyard area right in the same area where David's palace would have been and has been rediscovered. And supposedly that is the, the pit where Jeremiah was imprisoned. Jeremiah, any thoughts? The weeping prophet. Oh, so I didn't mention Lamentations, but Lamentation is written by Jeremiah, and of course it means the lamenting, the lamenting, the weeping. And the book of Lamentations, again, is one of those poetic books that uh, he just bewails, he mourns the, the captivity of Judah. And it was because of their own sin. So it's not a long book. I think it's five chapters long. But you can, you can just feel the intensity as you read through it. Jeremiah wrote that. Alright, so they go into captivity and here's the last two that are both in Babylon uh, that would take place in Babylon, Ezekiel and Daniel. <clears throat> so Ezekiel was probably taken captive in the second deportation at 597, 596, um, six years before Jerusalem. Six years? That's not right. Jerusalem fell in 586. It should say 11 or 12. Um, but anyway, he was taken captive, probably in the second deportation. And it says specifically that they settled on the Shabar River. And so in the book of Ezekiel, remember that passage where it talks about being a watchman to the house of Israel? That's in Ezekiel, and that's by the river Shabar. Um, so 2 Kings 24 talks about that as well. His wife died. The Bible gives us the when that event takes place. The first 24 chapters deal with judgment coming on Jerusalem. Now think about it. This is after the destruction of Jerusalem. He's in Babylon. He said Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So obviously he's not referring to the first destruction. He's referring to a later destruction, potentially the 70 AD destruction. So there's an apocalyptic form of writing comparable to the book of Revelation. And there's much writing in there about the temple. The temple, remember... In his day, when he's writing this, the temple had just been destroyed. And he talks about the temple. Now, the book of Ezekiel is one of those that we love to use when we refer to the, the temple that will be there. We call it the third temple. So the first temple was the temple of Solomon. That was already destroyed in Ezekiel's day. The second temple would be built after Ezekiel, but he wasn't referring to that one. He's talking about a temple that will be there when the Messiah comes to reign. And when the Messiah comes in the millennial reign, we believe that that temple will be there. And so we use Ezekiel as a good, strong prophecy of, of uh, what the world will be like, especially what Jerusalem will be like when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom. Any thoughts on Ezekiel? And then the last one, Daniel. See, I didn't even go into the stories. We can tell all the great stories of Daniel. So. Some of you would do good sleeping in an appliance den. Because you sleep in class. You know, so. 
Just go right down with the lions and take a nap. All right, but uh, Daniel, 6.20 to 5.30, thereabouts. So, by the way, Daniel <laughs> went to the den of lions. Look at the timing of that. That was, that was later in, the, in his life. He was probably about 90 years old. He was an old geezer when he went down there with the lions. But he wasn't afraid. I mean, think about it. He had seen the fiery furnace. And he had seen the Lord deliver him out of many great things. And Daniel being the godly man that he was. You know, there's no evidence at all of him being scared or questioning. He just said, okay, I guess I got to sleep down there for a night. I'll be back out tomorrow. I mean, he, he wasn't afraid of anything. And uh, he really did have his trust in the Lord. Um, but anyway, he was taken captive in 605 as a young man. He, was in, he influenced the kings of Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and I would say even later through his writings, he, he influenced Alexander the Great, the Greeks as well. And of course, we still have his writings today. Um, he, was he was a contemporary, of course, to Ezekiel. Right? Ezekiel was in Babylon, Daniel's in Babylon at the same time, and in Ezekiel 14 and Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel mentions by name Daniel. So, anyway, that to me is very key because there are those now, critics in the Bible, who say that the book of Daniel was written around 200 B.C., not in 500 or 600 B.C. And what that does is, the book of Daniel is so specific in its prophecies, that makes the book of Daniel history rather than prophecy. You follow me there? So if, the, if Daniel was written in 200 B.C., then all those stories that take place in Daniel 7 through 11 or 12 are just historical things, and they are absolutely very specific. This woman, queen, went from here to here and did this. I mean, it's very specific. So if, the, if that's prophecy, which we, of course, believe it is, the Bible says it is, then, then it was written before it actually happened, not after it actually claimed to have happened. So, but, but Ezekiel says Daniel was in Babylon. Okay, settled. You know, 600, 550, Daniel was there right at the same time as Ezekiel. Um, it was written, a good part of it was written in Aramaic, for the Gentiles, and the rest of it written in Hebrew for the Jews. So now, of course, we read it all in English. English. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> so we read it in English. We don't see it. But if you go back in and look at it, um, but there are small sections of it that are actually still written in the Aramaic. Like what? Not the Aramaic, in the uh, Chaldean. In the Chaldean. What? The handwriting on the wall. Handwriting on the wall. You're not saying it, I noticed that. Um, meaning means every person. Yes. Which means? Which means, I don't remember. Weighed in the balances and found wanting. Um, yeah, weighed in the balances and found wanting. So, it's interesting that those books were, were actually written in a different language even than the Hebrew. So, Okay, any questions? The end of God's working with the Jews in the Old Testament? No, no, absolutely not. It's just the end of the record that we have of that time period, and God refused for a lengthy period of time. God did not choose to speak to them, to reveal to them any new revelation for about 400 years. So that was God's choice because of their sin, because of their rejection of His ways. God said, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to hold you in arms. Like there were several times, I mean, if you know your history in this silent years now, the Maccabean revolt and so on, I mean, there was many times in there where they thought for sure that God was going to speak to them soon and he was going to deliver them from their oppressors again. It wasn't God. It was just God letting things happen, letting things, you know, go continue as it were, as it was. 
But God was not even close to ready to liberate them. And, of course, even in the days of Jesus, they were under bondage and oppression. So, um, he's not ready to liberate them yet. And even now, he's not ready. I mean, the Jews are very much, you know, there, there's a lot of freedom, but there's also a lot of, of struggle there. And someday, I believe, this freedom, this real liberty that the Jews will experience won't take place until their Messiah comes again. So, um, I'll just finish with this, close with this story. We... Our guide from 10 years ago when I was in Israel, uh, Eitan, some of you know who he is, he, uh, he, he didn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, or was the Messiah. And so if you ask him about it, he said, did Jesus liberate John Israel? No. Well, then he's not the Messiah. So I remember this very clear. It was, it was great. It was just an unbelievable setting. We're... we're not having a bad argument, we're just discussing things and trying to help him understand that the Old Testament was pointing to Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. And so we, somebody finally asked, okay, so when the Messiah comes, don't you think that Jesus, that he'll be like Jesus? And he said, he, it sure seems like it. It seems like the Messiah, when he comes, will be like what Jesus was. <laughs> right, then that, anyway, it's just really hard for, for Jew, Jewish people to put two and two together that the Messiah came and then left. Well, why did he leave? Why would he not then liberate us? And anyway, why? I don't really know that I've been answered. God, for that matter, God included a lot of the Gentiles. In this time period, obviously, this church age is primarily for the Gentiles, Romans chapter 9 through 11. So that's true, but he didn't have to do that. You know, he could have then liberated the Jews and set up Christ's kingdom on earth. Anyway, so Jesus is the Messiah. New Te Old Testament points him out. He comes in the New Testament, and uh, wonderful thing. Did you have a question? Or? I was going to ask, what, what is, is the Chaldean language still around? There are, there are evidences of it, yeah. I mean, there, there are writings of theirs, yes, definitely. But not as much, not nearly as much as the Aramaic, which was a later, came after the Chaldean language. The Aramaic and of course other things. Any questions? All right, test. I, don't, I didn't look at the final schedule. Let's see which day ours is. Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday afternoon, so it's the last one. Probably. Is that the library? Um, I'm sure, yes, we'll do it in the library, and I'm sure somebody's going to ask if they can take it early. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me uh, put things together, and then I'll send out. You won't, you won't take it a couple of days ahead of time, for sure. But I may let you take it earlier that day or something like that. So. Yeah. All right. It's been good having you in class. This is the best class, best Old Testament survey class I've had this whole year. <laughs> I appreciate it.